everyone, welcome back to Lewis Fiction and welcome to pre-writing MCU Spider-Man 4. This is my 2024 updated version of the pre-write. If you are brand new to the channel and love Spider-Man stories every single week, make sure you are subscribed. We are so close to that elusive 5,000 subscriber mark. I would love if we could hit that this summer and then maybe even push for 10,000 subscribers. That would be absolutely awesome. But with that being said, let's get straight into this. A year has passed since Spider-Man No Way Home. We open up with Peter standing over Aunt May's grave, once again asking her if she's okay. We get the sense that Peter hasn't moved on. We get the sense that Peter is still suffering from the consequences of No Way Home. Peter is suffering with mental health issues and Peter is suffering with the death of Aunt May. And this is when we are reintroduced to another character that we've become so familiar with from the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Of course, that is Happy Hogan, who once again bumps into Peter. However, obviously, because of the end of No Way Home, Happy doesn't know who Peter is. However, since it has been a year since Spider-Man No Way Home, they have bumped into each other a few times at Aunt May's grave. In fact, they are on first name basis now and they've gotten to know each other slightly over the death of May. Just as they get talking, asking if each other are okay, Peter's phone rings, duty calls, as he leaves Happy and swings into the distance. Peter's brand new phone tracker for crime alerts him to more criminal activity downtown in New York. Spider-Man swoops in and stops some criminals. And Spider-Man isn't lethargic and it doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. In fact, all the inexperience that he showcased during the last trilogy, the Homecoming trilogy, all but seems gone. Spider-Man is a very thorough superhero and he gets things done quickly and efficiently, representing how much time Peter actually spends as Spider-Man. We will talk more about this later on in the film, but now Peter does stop some criminals. Peter's been busted operations around the city, thinking that it's all connected. He's actually following a trail of crimes that have been happening over the last couple of months, and it's becoming apparent that he's become a real thorn in the side of people in the criminal underworld. We then cut back to Peter's apartment as the Daily Bugle report on Spider-Man as their main anchor of news. When the Spider-Man news passes, we are also introduced to the idea that Wilson Fisk is running for the mayor of New York City. This will also be showcased through the same news segment on the Daily Bugle as well. It is also revealed in this same scene that Peter Peter has been sending J. Jonah Jameson videos and photos of himself as Spider-Man. And this is also revealed to be the reason as to how he's being able to pay for his apartment. Along with the fact that he's at college, he also gets some rent covered by the college itself too. Also during this scene, we will get a good look at Peter's apartment. It is bare. There's nothing in it, showing how Peter Parker is slowly sort of fading from existence. He has no books, he has no posters, he has nothing of character. There is nothing that screams, hey, this is Peter Parker's room. This is Spider-Man's room only. There is nothing to showcase the type of person that Peter Parker is. It is all just equipment and tech and basically stuff that Peter uses out and about as Spider-Man. The one thing of note is the sewing machine in the corner that he used at the end of Spider-Man No Way Home. We then get a scene of Peter attending college where he goes to Empire State University. It is also kind of hinted at here as well that the only reason Peter actually goes to college is so that the college can pay for a part of his apartment. If not, Peter seems like he wouldn't really be bothered to be there, as like we mentioned, Peter Parker is slowly fading from his life. He has nothing to do with anyone, he has nothing to do with himself, he only really cares about what goes on while he's wearing the mask. Either way, while Peter is at college, we get introduced to a set of new side characters in this trilogy, including Miles Morales and Carly Cooper. Peter won't know these people very well, only on a first name basis. However, it's clear that Peter has interacted with these people enough to sort of know who they are. It is also hinted at at this point in the film that Peter might have a slight crush on Carly Cooper. They don't speak with each other, but they smile at each other in the hallway and nod to each other in class, nothing more. Peter longs for love. He longs for human connection, but he knows he can't. The weight of the loss of Aunt May reigns supreme on his shoulders. He would love to make a move on Carly Cooper. He would love to try and get to know her more, but being Spider-Man is holding him back from that. The teacher, who in this new trilogy will go by the name of Professor Miles Warren, will introduce the idea that the college class have to do a project, and they have to be in pairs, pairing up with one another to get it done. Peter is in fact paired up with Miles, and they get to work on the project together. However, just as they are about to use that same lecture to start on their project, Peter's phone is on crime watch and has to leave early, leaving Miles to start up the project by himself. Miles doesn't think much of it at first, as Peter leaves. This is when we cut to Spider-Man fighting another bunch of criminals. It is another criminal bust, and Spider-Man brings it to a close. When he bumps into a familiar face at the crime scene, Mac 
Gargan, the person that he put away during Spider-Man Homecoming. However, we learn in this scene, this isn't the second time that Spider-Man and Matt Gargan have come into contact with one another. It is revealed that after the end of No Way Home, Matt Gargan has been constantly escaping and re-escaping prison, which means that Spider-Man has put him away a few times before. They have a bit of witty banter with each other, and Matt Gargan is furious. Spider-Man has foiled his plans once again. However, before Peter could deal with the crime fully himself, someone else arrives on the scene. It is a woman, another vigilante figure, who goes by the name of Black Cat. Peter will be confused at first. He knows of Hawkeye, he knows of Daredevil, but he's never seen Black Cat before. As they both introduce themselves to one another after the crime scene, Spider-Man asks Black Cat, who is she? And she'll say that doesn't matter. She's trying to get to the bottom of all of these crimes just like Spider-Man is, but she's doing it for a different reason. A reason that she won't reveal to Spider-Man just yet. She thinks she has a lead. A man called Wilson Fisk is supposed to be at the top of everything. That's what Black Cat has discovered. Spider-Man and Black Cat call a truce and decide to work together on this case as their goals align with one another. We then cut to Matt Gargan in prison, where his family come to see him. Mac has a little girl who cries saying that she wants her father back. We then see the stakes for Mac Gargan here. We see what he is losing. He's fighting for his family. He isn't just another random thug on the street. Mac Gargan is given some humanity here. He is given a reason to fight, a reason to be a criminal. And it is slowly revealed the reason as to why he keeps trying to re-escape from prison over the last year. He has a family to fight for. He has a family to come back to. Mac will tell his daughter that he's going to make this right. He promises he'll make this right. And this is when we cut to none other than Wilson Fisk approaching Mac Gargan after funding his bail. Mac will ask Fisk why he bailed him out, and Fisk will tell Mac that he has a mission for him. The heroes of New York are crushing his empire, and they're coming pretty close to tearing the whole thing down. Once he becomes mayor, it'll be a lot easier, but until then, he needs help. He's already got forces keeping Daredevil occupied. He now needs someone to take care of Spider-Man. Because over the last year, Spider-Man has become a real thorn in his side. Spider-Man has almost become the worst part of the vigilante circle in New York. Spider-Man has power, and it's clear that a bunch of guns won't take him down. He needs someone more specialised to deal with his type of character. And this is where Matt Gargan comes in. Wilson Fisk will take him back to his hideout, where they reveal a machine and a costume. Mac will ask Fisk what he's going to do to him, and Fisk will say he's going to give him power, to defeat Spider-Man. Mac will ask what's in it for him, and Fisk will say he will reward him sufficiently. He wants him and his family to live wealthy, right? He wants him and his family to have no worries in the world. Mac simply gulps, but nods in agreement. Fisk will tell him that he can make all his worries go away if he just does what he says. And then in a moment of truth, Mac agrees as he steps into the machine and becomes the Scorpion. We then cut back to Peter in his apartment. Miles texts Peter saying that the college project needs doing. When will he be available to do it? Peter says he can do it tomorrow. We then cut to the next day as they meet at Peter's apartment. Miles decides to set up and get straight into it when Peter's new criminal phone tracker buzzes. All units are being dispatched down to Times Square. It's very rare that all the NYPD services would be called to the same location in New York, Peter will think to himself. That means that something big is going down. And that's when Peter finds out that a massive green scorpion is making a ruckus in Times Square. And Peter has to leave. He apologizes to Miles as he says he's going to have to leave. Peter has to take care of something that he forgot about. Miles is frustrated as he backs out of the door. Peter makes his way over to Times Square, swinging over to see what the commotion was. The scorpion will tell Spider-Man that he's been expecting him. As Spider-Man engages with the Scorpion, the Scorpion expresses his power. Spider-Man hasn't dealt with a villain like this since the end of Spider-Man No Way Home when he fought the Green Goblin. This catches Spider-Man off guard as Scorpion reveals his power. The performance enhancers and the mechanical suit given to him by Wilson Fisk has given him a fighting chance against Spider-Man. This is when Peter realizes that it's actually Matt Gargan underneath the Scorpion suit. Spider-Man will try to break through to Mac, saying this isn't him. He needs to stop this right now. The scorpion almost gets him down when Black Cat comes in to save him. However, Peter is hurt. A massive gash of blood is stricken across his chest. And with Peter down, they just about escape, with Black Cat helping them get away. We then cut to a scene where Black Cat and Spider-Man lay in an alleyway. Black Cat says he's losing a lot of blood as she pulls out some emergency bandages from her utility belt. There is a massive gash across Spider-Man's chest, and Black Cat helps him by cleaning it. Spider-Man will say they're onto him. That was Matt Gargan. They're fighting back, whoever they are, Wilson Fisk or someone else, they are fighting back. Cat will tell him to not worry and to just stay still as she cleans his wound. Peter grunts in pain 
as she cleans it more. She eventually finishes by placing some pressure on it as well. However, during this moment, they lock eyes, and in a moment of intimacy, they end up kissing, Peter feeling that human connection once again. Peter initiating the kiss, but Black Cat didn't stop him, as Black Cat leans in for it as well. They look at each other as they pull away, Peter with half of his mask up his face, but still covering his eyes, Black Cat with her mask on completely. Peter will say to Cat that he wants to know who she is under that mask. He wants to know who she is, he wants to get to know her, but Black Cat says that doesn't matter, she's a nobody. He's a nobody, affirming Peter's inner conflict. Peter will look down, as Cat will say they're both nobodies, running around in stupid costumes. Cat will say they don't need to make this any more than it needs to be. They kissed, and that was it. Nothing more. We then cut to the next day as J. Jonah Jameson is bashing Peter for not sending him videos and photos from last night's Times Square attack with the Scorpion and Spider-Man at the scene. Peter tells him he's sorry, he just didn't get any. Obviously, Peter knowing he was too preoccupied. Peter then goes into college that same day and Miles isn't very happy. Miles approaches him saying he's a jerk. He's a self-absorbed jerk and all he thinks about is himself and no one else. He says that he's getting someone new to work with on the project. Peter tells him to wait, but Miles says no. He tells Peter he needs to sort his life out. He can't just keep blowing people off like this. He's done, as he walks away, leaving Peter all by himself. Peter then sits alone that lunch, at college, on a bench, and none other than Carly Cooper approaches him. She sits down next to him and asks if he's alright. This is one of the only times that they've ever really spoken. But from a distance a few moments prior, Carly had noticed that Peter was all alone and kind of looked lonely and sad. Peter says that he's okay. Carly tells him that she sees him sitting by himself most of the day, most days, and not really talking to anyone. She says she's sorry if this is really weird, but she just feels bad for him. He probably has his reasons, but she wanted to make sure he was doing okay. Peter smiles, appreciating it, saying he is doing okay, as okay as he could do. Carly says this might be a bit forward, but if you ever need to talk, here is her number. As she hands Peter her number and walks off. Peter smiles, watching Carly as she walks off into the distance. For once in the last year, something nice actually happened to Peter Parker. This was something new. This was a feeling that Peter hadn't felt for a very, very long time. A light in the dark, if you will. We then cut to a scene with Scorpion and Wilson Fisk. They've battered Spider-Man down. Now they need to hit him where it hurts. They both come up with the plan to try and find someone who is close to Spider-Man that they can take and to kidnap so they can draw him out and try and get him to concede. The closest person that they can find to anything Spider-Man related is in fact Peter Parker, who is the one who takes photos and videos of Spider-Man for the Daily Bugle. Maybe he is their best shot. So Scorpion sets out on his mission, saying he'll go and pay Peter Parker a visit. We then cut back to Peter, who spends most of the afternoon making a new suit, as his old one got ripped. He visits Aunt May's grave once again, asking what does he do? Peter is slipping, and it's hurting people. What does he do? And then, none other than Happy Hogan, who appeared at the start of the film, appears behind him once again, telling Peter they have to stop meeting like this. Happy says he's feeling lost without her, isn't he? And Peter says he is. Happy will go on to ask Peter what he's struggling with, and Peter will say everything. He keeps people in his life at an arm's length because he's scared they'll be hurt by him, and he's too busy with his quote-unquote work life. Happy will say he knows how that feels, referring back to past events in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Happy will tell Peter that he has to make time for those people, and be honest with them. Tell them that you're busy, but you'll always be there for them, and most importantly, don't isolate yourself. It's not healthy. He'll go on to say that it's all about finding that balancing act. You can't have yin without yang, you can't have one without the other. And with that, Happy will walk off into the distance, and Peter will contemplate. He'll think to himself as he carries on looking over Aunt May's grave. Happy is right. Aunt May wouldn't want him to live like this. Neither would Uncle Ben. Neither would Tony Stark. Neither would anyone else who was in his life that loved him. No one would want Peter Parker to be in the state that he's in. But all of that will have to wait. Peter still has one main mission as Spider-Man. The Scorpion is still at large. The Scorpion is still out there and needs bringing in before he hurts or puts anyone else in danger. We then cut to another scene with Spider-Man and Black Cat, discussing for the final battle with Scorpion. They will say that it's only a matter of time before Scorpion tries to draw them out again. So this time, they need to be ready. This time, they need to be ready to take him down. But there is still one thing that looms over this situation. Spider-Man is confused. He asks Black Cat 
Why is he even helping him? What is in it for her? Why is she even doing this? Kat once again tells him that she said it doesn't matter why. That's not important. Who she is and her reasonings do not matter to him. Peter relays the message that Happy gave to him, telling her that it's not healthy to be isolated. It's not healthy to keep emotions bottled up inside. And with this, relaying that same message, relaying the lesson that Peter has just learned, Black Cat eventually breaks, revealing her face to Peter Parker, revealing to him that her name is in fact Felicia Hardy. Her father was killed by Wilson Fisk and she wants revenge. Getting back at him is all that matters to her now. And that's why she does what she does. She's fighting for what's right. She's fighting for what she believes is the right thing to do. And that's why Peter says that they will stop him and they will stop the Scorpion. We then cut to Miles, who is at his home in Brooklyn, working on the college project, when he feels a sense of remorse for how he spoke to Peter. He doesn't know what's going on in Peter's life. There could be a very good reason as to why he didn't show. Miles was just frustrated. He was angry. He feels like he was rightly so, but still, he doesn't really know Peter that well. Miles decides to talk to him in person as he heads down to Peter's apartment and knocks on his door, asking to speak to him. He didn't call because he thought Peter wouldn't answer, but as Miles knocks again, no one is in. Miles says if he's in there, he's sorry for speaking to him that way. He was just angry. He hopes he understands as he leans his head on the side of the door. But before anyone else inside could answer, the scorpion attacks Peter's apartment, bashing through the floor. Miles falls over as he cowers to the corner and then the scorpion sees Miles. The scorpion will ask, where is Peter Parker? And Miles says, he doesn't know. He doesn't even know him that well as he tries to run off. But the scorpion grabs him with his tail, holding him captive. Peter and Black Cat see the cop cars racing towards where Peter lives. They both travel over there to see the Scorpion holding Miles. The Scorpion drops Miles as Peter webs him to safety. They both engage in battle, Cat and Spider-Man both trying to corner the Scorpion, taking attacks together, trying to neutralize him. The Scorpion is eventually defeated in a massive battle right down to the wire with Spider-Man and Black Cat coming out on top. Scorpion is eventually taken away to Riker's Island. After all the dust is settled, we cut to the end of the film where Spider-Man and Black Cat are on top of a rooftop. Cat says that she thought about what Peter said. He's right. Looking for revenge and hiding behind a mask is isolating. She's going to have to take a break for a while and focus on her and see her family, because they're grieving too. They hug as they part ways, ending Black Cat's story there. However, Peter has some resolving to do, not just with other people, but in his own life as well. Peter gives Miles a call, and they make up as they agree to work on the project together. And Peter decides to set aside some time with Miles only so they can both work together and get this thing done. He puts the phone down and flicks through the rest of his contacts to see Carly Cooper. He presses the dial button as he asks Carly if she'd like to go for a coffee and maybe talk some things over. Peter finally realizing that maybe he should approach people. Maybe he should stop isolating himself from the world and build back up relationships with other people. Carly said that she'd love to. And Peter says, great, how about 12 o'clock tomorrow? And Carly agrees, saying she'll see him there. As they both put down the phone, we end the film right there. But there is one post credit scene in this film. Even though the battle was won and Scorpion was beaten, the war still rages on, as it's announced that Wilson Fisk wins the election and becomes the mayor of New York City, taking a power stance going forward for the rest of the trilogy. Thank you very much for watching my pre-write for MCU Spider-Man 4. If you guys did enjoy, make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe if you are new so you do not miss MCU Spider-Man 5 when that pre-write does come out. It should be coming out next week. Also, make sure to subscribe because we're so close to 5,000 subscribers on this channel. I would really love if we could hit that goal. With that being said, thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Take care and peace.